Okay, good evening everyone. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Jason Strauss, um, and uh, I, I helped along with Rachel Waldman and, and Yamit Alpern Call. It's not going to be there. <laughs> and, okay. Um, and Yoni Tights and Sarah Robinson, we put together uh, tonight's event. Uh, tonight is the second installment of Smashing Silence Tackling Taboos, which is Mount Sinai Jewish Center's uh, series on uh, mental health. Our previous event, which was a couple of months ago, was about depression and suicide. It was very well attended and well received. We got a lot of great feedback, uh, and so we decided to continue. Um, uh, tonight's event will be about uh, OCD and anxiety, as you know. Uh, so we're always looking for new ideas on, on future topics, so please uh, let us know. There are, just so before we start, if you want to grab, there are index cards on the side that you can take to either write down uh, questions for during the Q&A at the end of the event, um, or you can take notes during the event, or you could put it in the envelope where there, there's an envelope for feedback. Uh, the point of this series is to help inform uh, the community about mental health, the Orthodox community in particular, um, in general, hasn't talked about these issues publicly so much, and to help destigmatize um, different uh, mental illnesses and help uh, both people who suffer from those illnesses um, deal with them and, and uh, get the treatment that they need, and also to help people in the community know how to help uh, those who are suffering from those illnesses. So tonight we have, we have two speakers. Uh, our first is Yosef Schick. He's uh, from Queens. He's graduating YU uh, this, this spring. He's a psychology major. Uh, he is the co-president, along with Sarah Robinson, of Active Minds at Yeshiva University. Active Minds is uh, a collegiate organization that uh, helps raise awareness about uh, mental illnesses. He's also a research assistant at Psych Lab at YU, and he'll be speaking about his own personal experience uh, with anxiety. Dr. Regine Galanti, our second speaker, um, has a got her doctorate from Hofstra University, previously uh, was an active member here at Mount Sinai Jewish Center. Actually, she's one of the, my predece predecessors here um, as the chair of the Education Committee. She teaches psychology at, at YU and specializes in the treatment of children and adults with anxiety and OCD at the Center for Anxiety. So thank you very much again for coming. And without further ado, uh, Yos uh, Yosef Schiff. Hello, everybody. Hello. OK. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, some of my family is here, some friends who already heard this before. So thanks for coming again. All right. Um, I think, thank you to Sarah for setting me up with the uh, amazing people here at Mount Sinai. I, uh, it's a great opportunity. I um, don't see her though. All right, so my name is Joseph. As uh, I, I was born and raised in Queens, New York. I'm a middle child. I have two older sisters, and I have a younger brother. Um, I'm in, finishing up YU. I'm, I hope to be a psychologist. Um, in the next few minutes, I, I hope to describe to you what it's like to live with an anxiety disorder. Uh, but more than that, I hope to explain how to support and comfort comfort and help someone with an anxiety disorder or of any mental illness. So in, in the fall of 2009, I was diagnosed with uh, generalized anxiety disorder and social anxiety disorder. This was the uh, senior year of high school. Um, uh, when I was diagnosed, I was uh, a little surprised, but my mother kind of said it was stating the obvious that I had this diagnosis. Because for as long as I remember, I was a very anxious person. I've always been a worrier. I've always worried about things. Um, I really om worried almost about everything. Uh, it, my motto was, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Um, it didn't matter if that almost nothing ever did go wrong that I worried about. Um, I still worried. You might, suffer, you might say that I suffered from worst case scenario-itis, as I like to call it. Um, my mother likes to tell, as a little child, she would take me to shul and I would faint from uh, the, the anxiety. Um, I have no memory of this, but it sounds right for someone like me. Um, so let me give you a, just like a, a quick rundown of my anxiety. I, I have a, a tremendous fear of being late for things. Um, this event started at 
8 o'clock, um, didn't start till about 8.15. I left YU about 7 o'clock to get here, just to make sure that I didn't fall, break my ankle, get mugged, or any of the terrible things that might happen to me on the way here, just because in case they happened, because I knew they were going to happen, even though somehow I managed to get here at 7.15, because of course it's only a 15 minute, seven, uh, 15 minute walk to Mount Sinai. But I had to come here early. Um, uh, so it doesn't matter where I'm going, or if it's a party, or a doctor's appointment, I have to be... Uh, on time. Uh, this past perm, I was in a cab to my perm student, and we were five minutes late. And uh, everyone else in the cab was wondering, well, wh why are you so worried that we're, we're, we're late? You know, it's perm. What could go wrong? You know, it's just we're five minutes late. And, they, and I was trying to explain to them, you know, I, I had this big fear of being late. And they weren't getting it. So, and my, my chavrusa was actually in the car, and, and he asked, if you're so afraid of being late, why are you always late to Seder? So, <laughs> so uh, he, he, has, he has a point. Um, but I think that my need to be on time stems from my social anxiety disorder. I am afraid of the social repercussions of being late. Um, I might be looked at, people might judge me, maybe I'll hurt someone because I'm late. And that's, that's the social side of my anxiety, my social anxiety disorder. Um, I have a fear of looking, being looked down upon, being judged. But that's only half of it. The, I also have a uh, generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, this one's a little harder to explain, but I like to think of it like uh, chemistry. Um, a liquid takes the properties of whatever container it's in. I think that's why I see my anxiety, that it, that it molds and shapes itself around my life to whatever um, I might be going through, whether it's a test, whether it's um, something of any sort, I, I always worry about it. And, um, be, you know, because Judaism is such a, a center point in my life, I often worry about Judaism. And oftentimes, we, we live in a, we have a very intense religion, you know. The, the, the moment I dread most of the year is, is Nisan Tokef on Yom Kippur. Where we're saying who's going to live and who's going to die, because that to me is, it, it's a very it's a lot of anxiety. If you think um, for anyone, and so someone with an anxiety disorder, I, I take that tenfold. Uh, just the the idea of that. So I really it, it pervades my life. Um, but before I go on, I just want to say something that anxiety is very normal. Um, everyone worries. We take tests. We go on a date. We have an interview. They're all scary things. They all cause anxiety. And this is very good. It makes us prepare. It makes us you know aware of what, what we're up against. Um, without anxiety, the world would pretty much fall apart. But uh, what makes my anxiety different is that it's irrational. I remember the, the, when the first day of work, um, a few years back, uh, in my, one of my summer jobs, I was so worried that, any, that something would go wrong, I was going to be late, I was um, going to mess something up, or I was, it, was, it wasn't, wasn't going to be a good fit, they were going to ask me to go home. Of course, none of that actually happened. I still work here. I was work there today, and it's a great job, but um, I was still worried about all the possibilities. Like the worst case scenario, I just I have. Um, in uh, in twelfth grade, I was uh, I was with my school at a rally um, outside the UN. Like any respectable modern Orthodox high school, we were protesting Iran. So we, we got out of the bus. Some of us got lost. We were on the way to the UN. So I I was of course I started to get worried. You know, I'm going to get in trouble for being late, for being lost. Of course, that sounds irrational because it is irrational. Um, so I asked the police officer um, for directions. As I asked, I, I spoke with a slight stutter, as I was known to do. And so one of my classmates decided that that was funny. So he told me, Shik, you know, you just sounded like a total idiot. Um, so it, it's things like that that stay with you your entire life, uh, when, when people disregard you, when they insult you. And the sad thing about the story is that he probably has no memory of this whatsoever. But, but I remember it. Anyway, so after that incident, I, um, went, I, I had a, was very anxious for a few days. I missed a few days of school. I um, stayed home. So my mother took me off to the psychiatrist um, when I was diagnosed. So my doctor prescribed me with two medicines, um, one antidepressant, an SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, called Paxil, and another benzodiazepine called benzo, a benzo or clonopin, yeah, it's called clonopin, a lot of names for these things. Uh, he was very honest with me. He said, like, there's no guarantee that the Paxil would work. I might have to try another drug, which he was right about. I had to try another drug called Lexapro. Um, while I had some doubt, doubts about taking my meds, uh, my, my worries quickly dissipated. Um, without, without sounding too hyperbolic, I can honestly say that I was a different person after taking these antidepressants for my anxiety. Um, I went from a kid who was afraid to raise his hand to someone who was reprimanded for calling out in class. I, um, um, most of my social anxiety in just a matter of a month just disappeared. It was, it was quite shocking. I told an English teacher, who I also had in ninth and 11th grade, who I knew, um, sarcastically asked me when I grew a mouth, because I was suddenly talking in class. I received many of my comments, uh, my behavior change. 
Um, this was, wasn't all great, though. Um, I discovered that I lacked a lot of, of basic social skills that people learn. Like, as when you grow up as kids, we have interactions and we learn the rules of conversation, conventions that, that, that we have to follow. Um, it's rude to interrupt someone while, who's talking, and then not all things that are on one's mind should be shared. Um, but I never had really had the opportunity to learn these social conventions as I never really said much. So while taking SSRIs, I found myself interrupting people, I, saying things I shouldn't. In Israel, one of my rabbim uh, called me over to, to tell me that I was interrupting people in Shia, and then I had to, you know, stop, try to stop. Um, I had to learn a lot of things that people just knew, it, um, but through intuition. Um, also, SSRIs can have side effects that aren't great. After I, after I started to take um, my medication, I would forget to, I would forget to uh, take them, my nightly dose. And um, this is bad because if I go without about two days without taking it, and I'll forget to, I start having terrible side effects. It's something that can only be described as like a brain shock, really. Your brain's getting zapped. Um, something with the chemicals, I don't really know what it is. But it's pretty bad. So, I mean, and sometimes I still forget after five years of being on these medications. Sometimes, in the middle of the day, I start getting a headache, and I just, oh my, I can't believe I forgot after five years. I think I would remember, but I don't. But, um, and at their worst, there can be a nightmare, these antidepressants. Uh, at a certain point, my doctor tried to change me to a medication called uh, venfaxine, slightly different, uh, serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And um, I was actually in Israel at the time, and it had a paradoxical side effect, which means I had the worst anxiety I've ever had in my life for, for three days, and it was a pretty big, big nightmare. I had to get off that med, I had to get back on the old med, the old Lexapro. But um, it, that, was, that was tough. And the other drug I took, clonopin, was a completely different story. Um, anyway, if anyone has ever taken clonopin or another benzo, like they, they know what I'm going to say, it, they're, they're great drugs. They, they, they keep you calm, uh, you know, they, they relax you, they only take a few minutes to kick in. Um, they're very little work, all you do is take them. Uh, uh, and I thought they were the best thing, like really, I thought like, they were like a life changer. But uh, unfortunately I found out that they're not. I'm like, um, you build a tolerance to these medications pretty quickly, uh, so which means that you need more and more to get the same effect. So one milligram turns into five milligrams, which turns into 10 milligrams, which then turns into 20 milligrams, uh, which is not good to take that many milligrams. In addition to this, there's also a drug you might be familiar with called alcohol. Um, I remember someone, a professor saying that when, dying, when, when, when talking with someone who has an anxiety disorder, it's not a question of if they drink, it's how much they drink. Uh, which is which is true. I mean, alcohol is a. It, 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 to someone with an anxiety disorder, alcohol is great because it's it's a legal substance. Usually, you have to go to Colorado to get that stuff to reduce your anxiety, but you can just go to St. Nick and, and buy. Um, so it's much cheaper than going to Colorado. So um, so and I thought this is great. I can just combine the benzodiazepines and the alcohol and get even more anxiety reducing effect. But unfortunately, this is very dangerous. Um, the way the benzos and alcohol interact can have a near fatal reaction or fatal reaction in the body. Um, I wish I could tell you that I have never tried combining benzos and alcohol, but like I wish I could tell you that I've seen the Mets win the World Series. I can't tell you that I've mixed, I haven't mixed these. Um, there have been times when I've been so desperate for a relief from my anxiety that I've taken these two together. Um, I've been told that by my psychiatrist that at one point I was lucky to be alive because I took so many. Um, but today, as of today, I'm still on Lexapro and uh, two benzos called Valium and Xanax, so I alternate in the weekends during the week. I, I know much of, the anxiety, much of my anxiety is caused by chemicals in my brain, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, and I know that these medications help me keep my brain chemicals in check. Um, and they, they help me interact with people, and they, for the most part, they help me control my generalized anxiety. Um, in my first meeting with my psychiatrist, though, he told me that, that the drugs were only half of it. I also needed to uh, see a, a, a therapist to uh, get the full cure uh, for my anxiety. So we recommended a cognitive, beha cognitive behavioral therapist. Dr. Guanti can explain all that to you, uh, what that is. Um, so I tried it, and I was really impressed with myself because I made it through three sessions, uh, which was obviously cut short, but I made it through three sessions, which for me is pretty good. Because it's, it's, it's not a fun endeavor. All therapy, and especially CBT, you go in there, you actually talk about your anxiety head on. You don't dodge the question. Um, you, you make charts about your anxiety, you create hierarchies, you say what's the most anxious thing you can think of. And when it's all done, you don't get to escape it because you get to take homework home. And you get to do the homework at home. Which is, so it, it, it's, it's not, not fun. So even though I, I had to leave early through the therapy, I, it wasn't a complete failure. 
I learned about CBT and how it works, which is very valuable for me today. I, um, I got a lot of booklets and, and worksheets to, to help with my anxiety that I, I filled out and I read about, and I, I, I learned how to uh, identify triggers of my anxiety so I can avoid it and prevent those metaphor metaphorical triggers from being pulled. Um, I returned to therapy a few times after that. I had a pretty good run with the therapist in Israel when I was there in my first year. Um, his therapy was a little more talk than CBT, uh, a little more talking about my feelings. And, uh, he was a very good therapist, but unfortunately, I, um, I just didn't really click with him. For therapy to work, you, you need to build a rapport with your therapist, and the ther therapist needs to build a rapport with the patient. And um, I didn't really get that. So I, he was a great doctor, I just didn't like him. So that didn't work out so much. Um, you really need to like your doctor. Uh, something that's very important for therapy to work, I found. Most recently, I found success at the YU Counseling Center. For anyone who's in YU or has been in YU or going to YU, I can't speak of them highly. I s say enough good things about them. They, they do excellent work. It's free service. Um, uh, so, so what you heard so far was uh, my life with an anxiety disorder. But it's not my story. It's the story of 40 million Americans who will at one point in their life suffer from an anxiety disorder which is about 18% of the population, which means that everyone sitting here knows someone with an anxiety disorder. The math guarantees that. Um, so now that I've scheduled all with those numbers, uh, I, I want to tell you something. Uh, it's, a, it's a request from you, uh, something that I need. I need you to listen to those who need an ear, to those who need aid, to stand up for those who are hurting. I can say with almost certainty that I would not be speaking to you tonight if I did not have the support of my friends and family. Um, Rousseau said that universal silence is taken to imply consent. I need you to make sure that for those with a mental illness, there is no silence. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yosef. We'll hear more from him later during the Q&A session. Now from uh, Dr. Galanti. I'm a little bit shorter than everybody. Um, so first of all, it's great for me to be back. I lived here for, uh, I don't know, 10 years must have been, but still there's a lot of people around here who I don't recognize because the community changes, but it's really great to be here and you know I saw them downstairs a little bit and it looks wonderful so that's exciting for me um, as a former community member it was more regime but I'm can everybody hear me I know I'm a little bit sick and I'm talking into the microphone but it's looking like people can't hear me anyway Matt is there something we could do just see if you can hold a little closer what? a little closer like really talking into is that better Okay, good. Tell me, like, wait if something. If, <laughs> um, if you can, that would be great. Um, so when I was here, it was more regime, but now I go more by Dr. Galanti most of the time. Um, so I'm a clinical psychologist, and I'm actually the director of the Center for Anxiety in Brooklyn. Um, so very apropos, I guess, of tonight. And first of all, I have to, like, uh, Congratulate, or just to say, you know, say that was really brave and that you have a much harder job than I do as someone who, you know, um, <laughs> helps people with anxiety. It's a really hard step to stand up in front of this, all these people and share your experience, but I think it's a really important one. So thank you. Um, so to start off, by show of hands, how many of you have never been anxious? Okay, good. So you're all normal. That's good. Um, anxiety and really all emotions are normal. And the way I sort of conceptualize anxiety and what I'm going to do today is we're going to talk about what anxiety is, uh, who experiences it, and then some of the various anxiety disorders, and then I'll talk a little bit about treatment, specifically cognitive behavioral treatment, because that is my sort of purview. I'm not really going to talk about medications, but one thing I thought of, I just wanted to pick up on based on what Yosef was saying about his own experiences. So he mentioned how, you know, there are brain chemicals that get out of whack when someone has an anxiety disorder. Um, and most people think the way to change that is really by taking medication. And though that is one route, 
more of the newer research um, has been showing that um, another way to change brain chemistry is through behavior change. So, um, you know, psychotherapy, cognitive behavior therapy, therapy can actually change those brain chemicals the same way that medication does. Your life experiences change your brain chemistry, which makes sense, but we had never thought about that in that way before a couple of years ago. So it's an interesting mechanism. There's more than one way to skin a cat, one of those metaphors. Like, it works in terms of treatment as well. Um, so anxiety, um, the way I conceptualize it is there are three pieces. There's the what I think, the what I feel, and the what I do. Um, thinking is really the cognitions, your thoughts. So for anxiety, those thoughts are going to be the worries. And they're going to vary based on an individual, and they're also going to vary based on different anxiety disorders. So something like generalized anxiety is really um, characterized by general worry about a lot of different things in, in, in an individual's life. But something like social anxiety disorders are fear of public situations, fear of um, situations where you're going to be in a social situation. So your thoughts are going to differ based on the type of anxiety that you have. And even, again, um, the way I sort of conceptualize all anxiety is it's on a spectrum. So the difference between someone with an anxiety disorder and someone who's anxious, what is that difference? Um, you know, it's hard to say that there is a clear line in the sand. This is not like getting the flu, where you either have the flu or you don't, and you take medication, then you don't have it anymore. Everybody's anxious to some extent, and the way I conceptualize people who, let's say, need more help is how much is it affecting your functioning? If you're getting by and you have really excellent coping mechanisms, then you're not necessarily going to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. While someone who has a very low tolerance for anxiety and a small thing happens to them might be diagnosed in a different way. Um, so you really have to, con the way I conceptualize it is based on function functionality and based on how much anxiety is impairing someone's functioning. Um, so there's those thoughts. The next thing I want to think of when I'm thinking about anxiety, and again, this really works for any emotion, um, is um, the feeling of what I feel. And that's really um, the physiological reaction. For, so for anxiety, if you think back to any basic bio class that you've ever taken, they talk about the fight or flight response. Right Now some people say fight, flight, or freeze, they're all the same things. Um, What's going to happen when you feel anxious, if you're walking down, you know, you're t trying to take the one train, 190th, the big scary tunnel, you're walking there and you hear a noise behind you, what's your body going to do? What are you going to feel? You can throw things at them. Oh, for me and your eyes. What? Yeah, so what does that mean behaviorally? What am I going to see if I'm, um, you know, your heart's pounding? What else? Sweating. Blood pressure is going up, you're going to sweat. Anything else? What? And talk a you might talk a little faster. Um, <laughs> what? Breathing. Breathing definitely increases. Um, uh, digestion speeds up, so you might feel nauseous or like you need to vomit or, you know. Um, your pupils dilate, which is not something you would ever notice, but to let more light in in case someone were to jump you, then it's a good thing to be able to let in as much light as you can. Um, all those things, normal anxiety reaction. Um, and it's a fast reaction. You don't want it to be slow. If a tiger, for some reason, jumped through those windows, you wouldn't want to think, wait, is that a tiger? Is this dangerous? Hold on. Wait, let me think about this. You want to get the heck out of here as fast as you possibly can. That is adaptive. The people who get out fastest are the ones that are more likely to live. So we want that reaction to be fast. And that's also why that reaction, if, you, if you've ever noticed it, doesn't go away so quickly. It's not like, oh, okay, wait, that was safe. That was just my friend trying to play, like, thought they were funny to, like, jump on my back in the middle of the night when I'm walking down the street. Um, you're not totally calm right away. It takes time because the truth is, if you think about it historically, where there's one tiger, there's probably more. So you want to sort of keep your guard up for a little while. You don't want to, okay, threat gone, go to sleep. It takes some time. Um, and then uh, once you have your thoughts and your physiological reaction down, the next step is what you do. So what you do is basically in the title of the physiological reaction, fight or flight. So you're going to run away or you're going to face the threat. 
Um, very, very healthy if there's tigers or maybe even snakes or other scary natural things. Um, public speaking, not so much. If I was running out of the room right now because I was socially anxious, that would not be a very good thing for me to do in the middle of a lecture. So the reaction's not fitting with um, what the adaptive nature of it. It doesn't fit anymore. Um, so um, that's my basics, and that's going to come into play a lot when I talk about the different disorders in a little while. Um, so again, I am looking, the way I define normal versus pathological anxiety is um, I'm looking at whether the anxiety impairs functioning. I'm looking for when this system is going off for no logical reason. I'm looking for the false alarms. Um, because alarms are good. False alarms are not so good. Everybody's going to have some false alarms. Everybody's going to have some times when they're anxious for no reason. But how do you deal with those? And how often is it happening? So in terms of um, background information, so Yosef know, mentioned like 15% of people in the population are typically anxious. I think the numbers are kind of higher. Um, it's looking more like between 20 and 30 percent, the most recent sort of epi epidemiological studies are looking at. So if you look around, I have no idea. I'm very bad with this kind of, uh, like how many people are in this room, would someone guess? Uh, so 100, so you're talking about like 30 anxious people in this room? Um, I like to play this game. I think it, con it conceptualizes it better, makes the numbers seem bigger. Um, like something like OCD, I see a lot of OCD in my practice, and people will say, one to two percent, that's tiny. No one else has OCD. I'm the only one. I'm like, how many people are at a typical wedding? 500? Okay, so 500 people are at a wedding. You're talking about 20 people with OCD at the wedding. That's a lot of people. That's a table of OCD people at a wedding. That's not so little. <laughs> so, you know, like, you should be aware that, that this is, you know, dealing with a lot, this is a very, very, very common problem. Um, and the courses typically it waxes and wanes over someone's lifetime um, if they don't get treatment. If they get treatment, then we're pretty good at treating anxiety disorders. Um, it's more likely in women than men, 60% more likely in women than men, but I'm not sure about that statistic either because I think there's more of a stigma against men with mental illness. And also, if you look at the child data, and that's until age 18, um, the numbers are equal. So either boys with anxiety disorders are disappearing at age 18 or women are more likely to self-report after age 18. Um, so something's going on there, I think, but um, I guess We'll leave it another 10 years and see what the data says. It doesn't really matter for an individual. Um, and um, when we're talking about anxiety disorders, what exactly are we talking about? So there's generalized anxiety disorder. So that's the many worries in different areas of life. Um, then there's social anxiety disorder, which is uh, a fear of social performance situations. Um, so someone who you know has to public speak and very anxious about that, or um, you know eating in front of others, um, uh, dating would fall under social anxiety. Um, then there's the specific phobias, which are um, fear of something specific. So that could be an animal, you know, dog phobias. Phobias are really pretty common. They're like a 10% prevalence rate, um, which makes sense. And they also exist in a spectrum. How many people do you know who are afraid of dogs? How many people in this room are afraid of dogs? Come on, there has to be people in this room that are afraid of dogs. <laughs> but again, it becomes a question of how much is it affecting your functioning? Are you not walking on the street at all because you're afraid of dogs and you live in the city? That's a problem. That's the kind of person that I'll often see in my office. Um, but if you're able to, you know, even just cross the street, a lot of times it's not impacting your functioning enough. But, you know, would I say that that's not a phobia? Actually, when I walked out of my office today, they were doing a group with a snake. I don't know, they were treating some snake phobia. We do a lot of this kind of treatment with real life stuff. So like, you know, walk by room, there's snake, and it's like, oh, okay, hi. Um, not a phobia I have, but last week when there was a, there was a tarantula in the, in the room, I wasn't into that. Um, so there's this spectrum of phobias that, you know, it's very normal. Like, why would I want a big hairy tarantula crawling on me? I don't. And normally that's not a problem. But when I see someone who's 
like crashing their car, you know, because they think they might have saw a spider and they can't possibly drive. That's a problem. All of a sudden, you know, we need help with that. Um, then another anxiety disorder that we'll often see is panic. Um, so panic disorder is the re is recurrent unexpected panic attacks for at least a month, but it's also worry about having additional attacks. And um, the reason why I'm being a little bit specific about it is because panic attacks are not the same as panic disorder. 50% of the U.S. population will have a panic attack at some point, and not all those people have panic disorder. Not half the people in this room have panic disorder, or will over the course of their lives. Um, panic disorder is really characterized by the fear of having another one. Plenty of people have one panic attack and go, oh my gosh, what the heck was that? I was afraid I was going to die, but then I didn't, and I'm over it. Um, so panic attacks, while the other sort of anxiety disorders, um, thoughts have a really big role in them, what, what your worries are, um, panic attacks really tap into that physiological reaction to anxiety. Uh, that fight or flight response is basically going off for no reason. So imagine you're walking down the street and all of a sudden you start feeling your, your heart's racing, you're sweating, you're trembling, you feel short of breath, you get dizzy because what happens is that um, when you um, start breathing fast, you're, not, you're getting more oxygen into your system but you're not releasing carbon dioxide at the right rate so that imbalance causes you to get headaches and feel dizzy and feel like you're short of breath even though you're breathing fine. Um, that feeling makes people feel like they're going crazy, they're having a heart attack and you know, they're gonna die. So all of a sudden they end up in the ER for panic disorder. I'm rarely the first person they see. They go to the ER, they're like, I'm having a heart attack. The ER makes them do all these tests and then they go, no, you need to see a psychologist. Or at least hopefully that's what they say. Sometimes it takes them a little longer. It really bothers me. But you know, we have really good relationships with cardiologists because cardiologists are the people who see panic disorder first. Um, it, feels like a heart attack, and if it didn't, there wouldn't be people walking around going, oh my god, what's happening to me and how do I stop it? Um, so um, basically, they're having false, al people with panic are having these false alarms, these, this physiological reaction is going off for no reason, and they look around and they say, okay, is there anything dangerous? And they look, and the answer is basically no. So then they look inside themselves and they say, okay, it must be that then I am having a heart attack. That's the only possible reason for what I am physically experiencing right now. And then um, what normally happens is um, people will take steps to start avoiding panic attacks. And that could be only going somewhere with your roommate or not leaving the house or, you know, always traveling with a water bottle because if I take a sip of water when I first start feeling the symptoms, then the symptoms go away. And they start doing all these things um, that maintain the, the panic because basically what happens is you tell your body, yes, there was something to be afraid of, but now you fixed it. So since you fixed it, you're okay. But if you didn't take that sip of water right then, you probably would have died. So you're creating this false, basically, um, system where you're telling yourself that you're safe because of something that you did that's really superstitious. Um, and it maintains the panic attacks because then every time you're, you're, you're reaching for the water and the water's not there, you're really panicked. And, um, and I'll talk about treatment and what we do for that in a few minutes. And then I'm also going to mention OCD. It's not technically an anxiety disorder anymore. Um, the DSM, which is the, the book that we use to diagnose mental illness, or psychiatrists really use, psychologists don't use it as much, but we use it because that's what insurance goes is based on, um, is, um, you know, so where, how did I get to this? Oh, they, they took out OCD. OCD is now its own thing. And the reason why is because all these other disorders, when you're talking about social anxiety disorder, when you're talking about specific phobias, generalized anxiety, you're anxious basically from the beginning. Their anxiety is the baseline, um, and what you're anxious about changes. OCD, people with OCD are not necessarily anxious unless they can't do whatever it is that makes them feel better. So the anxiety is almost like, it's not, it's not coming in at the same place. There's a lot of anxiety with OCD, but if you're managing your OCD well, and you're doing your compulsions well, then you're probably not anxious. You get anxious when you stop doing your compulsions. And maybe I sh 
let me explain OCD a little bit better and then I can move backwards and say that again. So OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, I actually hate it when people say things like, oh, that's so OCD or she's so OCD because it's not true because they might be OC, but they're not, they don't have the disorder unless it's really impairing functioning. Um, and then you wouldn't be saying that because it would be a really mean thing to say to someone who's actually OCD, like, oh, you're so OCD. Um, the truth is now that I'm saying that, I say that in session all the time, but I guess it's a little bit different because I get to say things like this because that's why people pay me. Um, so obsessions, obsessions are really um, recurrent and persistent thoughts or impulses or images um, that are intrusive. So they're really the thoughts. Um, you're having a thought, um, I'm contaminated. Oh my God, I'm contaminated. Because of that thought, you feel anxious. So you have a thought, your anxiety goes up. You don't want your anxiety to go up. So you do something. That thing that you do is called a compulsion. It's a, an action that you repeat in order to make the anxiety go away. So you do a compulsion, your anxiety goes down. But what happens then is because you did your compulsion, your, your, your brain starts, it seems like it's a good system. You do your compulsion, your anxiety goes away. The problem is really that it doesn't work so well. If it worked, then what would the problem be? You feel contaminated, so I wash my hands. Done. The problem is that the feeling of contamination then comes back. So it's not really a, an effective system. Um, so um, the anxiety shoots back up, and, the, the, and because the anxiety shot back up, you wash your hands again. So you end up stuck in this loop of obsession, compulsion, obsession, compulsion, obsession, basically over and over and over. Um, and the compulsions start really impacting someone's life, um, washing their hands for over an hour a day, um, having um, these really intrusive thoughts basically all day, every day. Um, and one thing that's interesting, or one thing that my husband told me that I really should emphasize with OCD, because I guess it comes up at Shabbos tables all the time, I guess when I'm talking to people, is people with OCD are more, no more likely to act on their obsessions than anyone else. So if someone with OCD has a thought, uh, you know, maybe I'm gonna kill someone. We have those crazy thoughts all the time. But what do you do when you have a crazy thought? You throw it out, you're like, huh, oh, that was weird, and you keep going. <laughs> I'm t if you don't believe me, how many of you have thought about jumping onto the subway track for one reason or another? You're waiting for the subway and you're like, oh, let me just, yeah. It, that's a crazy thought, guys. <laughs> that, that's the kind of thought that someone with OCD might have. You have a crazy thought, you throw it out. You go on with your life, right? Like, so they don't go on with their lives. They take a step back. They're like, oh my God, I'm going to jump onto the subway track. I need to stand back here. And that's the only thing that's going to hold me back. That's not the only thing that's going to hold them back. They're being extra sensitive. You guys are the ridiculous ones for then going about your lives. Um, they're taking sort of the safe road. And one thing I've learned as a clinician is how to recognize those thoughts. Because I found that if I recognize those thoughts, it makes me a much more you know, um, sympathetic ear and much more likely to, to be able to say, oh, yeah, I, I guess I wait when I find those thoughts. Like I was driving a couple days ago, and I, there was a guy with like two huge kayaks on the back of his car in front of me. And I'm thinking, those kayaks can fly off that car and hit me, and I'd be dead. And I'm like, whoa, okay, I have to tell someone. And then I go and I tell my next OCD patient, like, yo, oh, guess what? I had, you know, an un unwanted intrusive thought. And, you know, like, um, and, and they're like, well, what'd you do next? I'm like, I don't know. I just kept driving and went away. Um, but if I then pulled my car over and, you know, said, oh my gosh, thank God, I pulled over just in time so I'm not dead, all of a sudden it's, it's creating this behavior that I have to do over and over. So um, you got to be careful with those. And, that, and OCD comes in a lot of forms. The obsessions um, can be about checking and cleaning. Um, the one that people like to talk a lot about is scrupulosity, which is religious OCD, so the religious symptoms. Um, OCD is actually no much, no more likely in a religious population than it is in a non-religious population, but we do tend to see the religious symptoms in religious people more. Um, but it's, you know, I think it's a very, um, uh, it's just not true that we see it more in religious people. Um, yeah.
So I happen to see a lot of it, but I think it's because I work with a lot of room clinicians, so the religious people with OCD find us. Um, and I'll talk about the treatment in a few minutes. Um, so, um, yeah, but like I said, they're no more likely to act on their thoughts as anyone else. So now let's talk a little bit about therapy. So therapy-wise, um, what I do is cognitive behavior therapy. Um, very, very effective for treating anxiety disorders. It varies in its effectiveness, but uh, for something like OCD, we're 85 to 92 percent effective. For panic, the number's also around 85 percent. Um, with generalized anxiety, we don't have, have as good of a track re record, I don't think. I only know the numbers for the ones that we're really excellent as, because those are the ones I'll throw out in session. I don't throw out the, you know, like, we're better than everything else, but we're not as amazing at, at it. Um, we're still helpful. But, um, so, there's really two, when you talk about CBT, it's really two separate therapies. There's the cognitive therapy, and there, there is the behavior therapy. Um, so the cognitive piece is not really about, it's about changing your thoughts, but it's not necessarily about thinking more positively. It's actually about thinking more realistically. Um, often people with anxiety misjudge the possibility of something happening, and they act according to that misperception. And what I do is really help people change this perception, help them understand that your thoughts are not facts. And we need to look at the evidence for a specific belief and not take it as a given. Um, for example, one fear I've been encountering a lot, I see a lot of kids, and a lot of kids will tell me, like, I'm afraid of being kidnapped. Like, oh, really? Okay. So how many people do you know? I'll start with that. And they'll be like, I know a hundred people. I'm like, okay. Have any of them been kidnapped? They're like, no. I'm like, okay, your mommy's in the room, because I normally have the parents in the room. How many people do they know? 500. Mommy, do you know anyone who's been kidnapped? And I'm saying it's like, because I did this you know, literally right before I came here, so I was talking to a kid, I should probably have thought of a more adult example. But the idea is really the same. No one knows anyone who was kidnapped directly. So maybe if you go out three levels, but chances are that's not going to happen. And as much as like, okay, we know you're probably not going to be kidnapped, not, not the thing to fear. Um, it works the same with a lot of fears, you know? What are your chances of dying in an airplane crash? It's like a gazillion to one or something. Um, you're much more likely to die in a car accident on the way to the airport as, than you are to get on a plane. Um, pointing that out. Um, cognitive, so cognitive therapy is going to help, and it's going to be directed towards um, the thought parts. So it's going direct, to uh, be directed towards um, the worries of a specific disorder. So for social anxiety disorder, you might ask a question of, do you really have any friends? Like so someone with social anxiety might come in and say, well, I really don't have any friends. I'm like, wait, hold on, is that actually true? Because it might not actually be true. It might be true, in which case we need to help someone get social skills, we need to help them build relationships, but it might not even be true. So the first step is finding out, like, are you really as bad, uh, like, as, are you really what you, what you say you are, um, you know, or in the case of panic, people with panic are afraid of the, that they're going to die or they're going to go crazy. Is that really true? And I'll say things like, oh, well, I've, I've never had anyone that I've treated with panic disorder die on me, but you might be the first one, I guess. Like, um, and I, the reason why I say that is really because I'm more of a behavior therapist. As a cognitive therapist, I wouldn't say that. But, you know, I do try to tap into people's worst fears because eventually they just look at me and they're like, you're just saying that, right? And I'm like, oh. I hope my malpractice covers this and is another one. <laughs> um, but then sometimes I think, I really hope, maybe I shouldn't put this in my notes. This is kind of crazy what I did today. Um, but we'll talk about statistical probabilities. And... I think this is important no matter what. I talk to people a lot about what exactly are they, they afraid of. So before I asked how many of you are afraid of dogs, but if I asked all of you what about being afraid of dogs are afraid of, it wouldn't be the same. Some people are afraid of little yappy dogs. Some people are afraid of big dogs with big teeth. Some people could be afraid of some random thing. A couple weeks ago, I was working with a little girl who was afraid of flying on an airplane and her family was flying to Israel, so obviously that was not gonna work. And finally, I asked her, like, what are you afraid of? She's like, I'm afraid I'm going to drown. I'm like, okay. So we watched the LL safety video, and we found out where the life vests were, and she felt better. And I'm like, okay, girl, if your plane goes down, 
yeah, the drowning is not going to be your issue. But she wasn't afraid anymore, so it didn't matter. Uh, you know, she wasn't afraid of that. She was afraid of drowning. So, yeah, problem solved. Best therapist ever. No. Um, okay, but really, like, I would say my bread and butter um, is the behavior therapy piece, and that's exposure. And when I say exposure, I mean facing your fears. Um, my goal when someone comes in and is anxious is to help them face their fears and find out what happens when they do. If you're having a panic attack, what happens if you have a panic attack and do nothing? What happens if you drive while you're having a panic attack? So if someone's having a panic attack when driving, so they're not driving, we get, get into a car and we drive. And hopefully they have panic attack and hopefully we keep driving. We stop avoiding things. That's what I help people do. Someone's afraid of dogs, we bring in a dog. And we say, okay, let's see how far we can take this. Can you pet the dog? Can you hold the dog in your lap? And that's when I'll do the kinds of thing. I'll tap into their fears. And the reason why I do this is not because I'm a sadist. I don't think I am. It's to help them realize that what happens with anxiety is it goes up. And then eventually you think, I don't know what people think, that it's just going to go up and they're going to explode. I don't know. Um, it typically doesn't happen. So far, no one has ever exploded in my office. Um, it tends to then come down. And it's really unexpected. It'll go higher, higher, higher. And if they stay with it without avoiding, it starts falling and falling and falling. Um, and those homeworks that, you know, as they've mentioned, those are all about then going home and doing more of that. Um, putting yourself in a situation where the things that you're afraid of and watching your anxiety hopefully go down, but sometimes go up first and then go down. But normally people don't stay in situations that make them anxious. So they don't learn that their anxiety will go down if they confront it. Um, so I really, I feel like I'm in the business of helping people confront their fears. So with panic attacks, that's bringing on the physical symptoms without letting them run out for fresh air and without letting them take a drink of water. Um, not me letting them more, they agree to do this. Um, for, um, for OCD, there's an extra piece. It's called exposure and response prevention. So you're having those obsessions and we want to ex expose you to those thoughts of maybe, my, maybe I have germs seeping in through my skin but then also not do your compulsions. So I recently had a case with, uh, with a woman, a young woman who was afraid she was gonna kill people. Scary fear, I would also would be afraid if I thought I was gonna kill people. Um, so the exposure was, I actually, I work in Brooklyn so I was driving there and I realized that I had forgotten my knives, which was the plan. Um, so I called my mother, I'm like, Mom, do you have, I really need your really biggest knife. She's like, why? I'm like, I need them for work. She's like, what are you gonna do? I'm like, I just, I need someone to hold a knife at me. And she's like, well, can I give you the dull knives? I'm like, no, 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 big ones, only big ones. Um, so she thought I was nuts. They're a, little, they're a little afraid. And people will always tell me, like, aren't you afraid to have someone who's OCD, who's afraid that they're gonna kill people, like hold a knife at you? And absolutely not. Because if there is anyone who's not gonna kill me, it's gonna be someone with OCD about killing people. They're so afraid of killing people that the idea is, Holding a knife at my, you know, and my chest is going to make her realize, like, all of a sudden her anxiety is going to climb and climb and climb, and then she's going to be like, wait, what am I standing here with a knife for? This is ridiculous. Um, and that's typically what we see. We, you know, like, like I said, I literally walked down to my office and I passed a snake on the way here. I'm like, oh, I'm late, but otherwise I would love to play. <laughs> um, <laughs> We help people, you know, really get exposed to their fears. Um, and with that religious OCD, we're going to really do the same thing. We're going to help people what, in that case, obviously, we're stuck with, you know, we're bound by halakha. But what we'll do is we'll work with rabbis and we'll find out what are the limits that we could push this. So it could be a lot of times I've, I've, I've gotten socks to do things that I did not think were allowed. Um, in all different areas. So like, you know, a lot of times if you get a good rabbi, it's gonna be, it's gonna be pretty lenient on what you can do. Um, or, you know, within the bounds of what's allowed. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Of, um, fear of idol worship is something that we've seen that that's actually a tough one because you're actually not allowed to bow down to idols. Um, so, um, but I, you'd be surprised by how many people come in and they're like, well, I'm afraid that I'm accidentally bowing down to idols. 
Um, okay. <laughs> because if you think about it, there could be an idol ev- everywhere. Like, oh, that table could be an idol. Like, and all of a sudden, when I bow, did I bow to it? Um, it can get complicated. The easier ones are stuff like, you know, like, well, did I touch my hair? And then do I have to wash my hands? You know, that kind of stuff. So we just tell them, like, no, you're not allowed to wash your hands. Um, and they need to live with the not washing their hands. And they need to live with the anxiety. And it will go down. Um, so, um, I think that's really the basics of what I do. And, you know, what I want to end with is, um, so anxiety, OCD, um, those kind of disorders are really, really, really common. And there's a lot of suffering there. And I think, you know, um, we need to be attuned to that and know how normal it is. Um, and also that it's very treatable. So, um, you know, if you know someone who's experiencing this kind of anxiety, um, helping them get the right help. So it could be in the form of medication, it could be in the form of, you know, helping them find a good therapist, which is way harder than you'd imagine. And I apologize on behalf of my profession, um, I guess, for that. Um, And it could be also, you know, just listening and without judging. Um, And, um, you know, and I think that's really that. So, thank you. Um, Sorry. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Galanti. Um, We are going to have a cute time for questions and answers now. Um, If you are comfortable asking your question in public, please feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm going to come around, uh, give out index cards to anyone who would like to write down their question so that they can ask it anonymously. Sorry. Um, I don't really think it's about compromising a value system as much as helping people who need help in the way that they need it right now. Um, You know, like, a lot of times we're mafia on a lot of things, and there are some times when it's important to be a little bit more mechel in order to help people get the help that they need. And I think that that sometimes, let's say, someone who's experiencing scrupulosity, that's not the time to be mafia. Um, you know, that's not the time we tell people, like, spend extra time making sure you have kavana on each word, because if you do that, then they're going to, um, you know, that's just going to exacerbate the OCD. It's just going to keep them from, you know, keeping a lot of other things down the line. So that's just something that we work with rabbis in order to do what is they're comfortable with in order to help someone get rid of the OCD. So this question is, why does someone who excels in or enjoys an activity some, some, sometimes develop an anxiety about it, like an experienced actor who out of the blue develops stage fright? Um, so I really need to know more about a situation. I'm very into, um, you know, individuals, and everyone has their own history. And often in a case like this, like if I see someone who out of the blue develops stage fright, it'll probably be something There'll probably be something that 
um, might not be so noticeable that happened before the stage fright. It could be that, you know, they were sick and they were afraid that they weren't going to perform as much, or they had a panic attack, or something triggered it, and they start getting worried that it's going to happen again. They're going to freeze up. So um, the causes of anxiety are really, like, they're a mix between environmental, um, biological, normally, some they're somewhat genetic, you know, one in four um, people with an anxiety disorder have, but uh, one in four parents uh, with an anxiety disorder will have children with an anxiety disorder. So there's some heritability there. Um, but it really, like situational factors are big. So um, we need to pay attention to them and every person is different. Um, how do ticks fit in with OCD? Does everyone with ticks have OCD? How can they be cured? So ticks, the way I see it, fall under a larger umbrella with the OCD. Um, and um, there is um, a comorbidity between ticks and OCD. They do coexist often, but not always. Um, the, the way I conceptualize ticks is their repetitive behaviors that um, you know, if you talk to a physician, they'll often say they're, they're involuntary, but that's not quite the case, because often people with tics can suppress them for certain periods of time. Um, so they're somewhat involuntary, and they're somewhat under voluntary control, and there are very useful um, treatments for tics, mostly something called habit reversal, um, where and you teach people uh, behaviors that are physically incompatible with the tic. So if someone has a, um, I was gonna say eye blinking, but that's the worst tic. I'm very bad at, there are some clinicians who work with tics, work great at imitating tics. I am awful at imitating tics. It makes me not as good of a tic therapist as they could be. But if someone has a tic where they, a verbal tic, where they'll, a lot of times, um, once you start treating ticks, you notice them all the time. People on the subway are always like <clears throat> <clears throat> all the time. So that if someone has that kind of tick, you'll figure out something that they can do um, while that they can't possibly do the tick while they're doing it. So for something like that, if you're breathing out, you can't make that noise. So you would teach someone whenever they have the urge to first teach them how to detect the urge and then teach them how to um, do a competing response whenever they feel the urge. Um, so in a sense, it's like exposure with response prevention, but it's also very different and this is specific to our babe, so. Um. Um, sometimes someone with anxiety or OCD is aware that it is not logical or irrational. Why is that awareness not enough to overcome the anxiety or OCD? So actually, I'm gonna stand up, I feel funny sitting. Um, uh, a pre pre one, of the, one of the conditions for having OCD is you need to have some, some awareness that, um, that, that your, your behaviors or your compulsions are irrational. Um, if you're not at least somewhat aware, then it's, um, then, you know, then, we look at more psychotic disorders. If you really think that, like, you know, it, there has to be that link. You need to be aware. It's definitely not enough. Um, people with OCD will tell you, I know this is crazy, but I just feel like I need to do it anyway. It's more the feeling of this is what helps me get my anxiety away. So they're doing the compulsions to relieve the anxiety. It has nothing to do with rationality. Um, the reason why I sort of, uh, personally moved away from cognitive therapy is because I found that talking to my patients about the statistical likelihood that something was going to happen versus not happening did nothing. They were like, I get that. I get that I'm probably not going to die, you know, on a plane. It doesn't help. I'm still terrified. Um, so it almost seems like there's two systems in our brain, a rational one and an irrational one. And often when I'm treating anxiety, I sort of feel like I'm working in the irrational system. And the way to deal with the irrational system is show me. Show me meaning like let me um, let me feel like I'm gonna die, but do it anyway and see what happens. So then, when you're you're basically teaching the irrational system that there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, but I have a very hard time, actually, I guess even personally as a clinician, 
um, dealing on that rational side because very much it feels like this emotional anxiety is not, is not operating on the same plane as the rational side. I know that all my anxieties are rational, it doesn't matter. Uh, I still I still have anxiety about it. It's as simple as that. I know someone who worries a lot, but I don't know if it's an anxiety disorder or not. How can I help them? What's the best way to start a conversation? Uh, do they do they start visiting a psychologist? So uh, the first thing I would say is that um, make sure that you are a very close friend with them before approaching them. Uh, I would never want to be approached by someone who I'm not very close with, who I'm not very close with, and have them tell me that I have an anxiety disorder or I might have an anxiety disorder. I would tell them to shut up and you know, go away. Um, if you, so if, if you know someone who, who might be suffering from anxiety disorder, but you're not a very close friend with them, find out who is a very close friend with them and get that person to, to speak to them. Because I can only speak from personal experience. The only people I'm comfortable speaking with about this Besides everyone in this room, <laughs> not, it's very close friends. So, um, uh, so make sure that you have a relationship with them first. Um, uh, how can you help them? Uh, I guess talk to them. Uh, see if they're you know you you, you guys heard uh, what makes them a disorder. So ask them to find out if, if it's disrupting their lives. Um, if you think it does, um, I would say you know maybe talk to them about seeing a. Seeking help. Um, uh, that's, but obviously, do this all with, um, like, don't say I, I, you should, because that's the, I, I know from experience, when people tell me to do things, I immediately do the opposite. I'm not going to want to do that thing. So if you, if you suggest things, that's, that's the best way to do it. And don't say you should. Um, do you start by seeing a psychologist? Um, I guess so. Uh, that's one way to do it, or speak to, I don't know. I think it's a hard one. I, I totally agree that I think it's, you know, people will seek help and they're ready to seek help. It's more about knowing, like giving them the options and, and letting them know that you're there when you want them and when, when you know, when they are ready. Um, someone else said, what pushes people to actually seek help? And um, I think that's sort of related. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons why people will finally seek help, but I think they have to come to it on their own. Um, it could be that they're, you know, dealing with something that they finally realize they can't ma manage on their own. Um, I recently am working with a teenager who um, came to seek help because she has a family wedding in Terrace in Queens and she's afraid of taking elevators. So, um, it's, you know, it's like big in the sky, gigantic thing, there's no other way to get up there, it's like 13 floors up and she needs to take an elevator so all of a sudden she's seeking help. Actually, my practice has two offices, one's in the Empire State Building so we don't see a lot of fear of heights, but we find <laughs> that like when people are afraid of heights, if they get themselves to our office, we're on the 59th floor, like no problem, it's like two sessions later than done. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh I was afraid of heights, but that's over. Um, so, um, yeah, I, having the resources is hard. There's a lot of great websites. Um, uh, for OCD, there's IOCDF, the International OCD Foundation, is a wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, uh, ADAA is another one, I think. I think it's on the pages that you have. Those are the organizations I typically go to. Um, uh, insurance is tough. I think that's one way to help people with anxiety, trying to sort through the mental health professionals in their insurance network if that's the only way to go um, because um, often it's very hard to figure out and a lot of times the people on that are listed on the panel on the website are not currently taking your insurance and even if they are they might not be what you're looking for because if you're looking for a cognitive behavioral psychologist good luck finding one because they're like they're, it's really hard to find a mental health person who takes insurance. Um, I've been looking for referrals for, I think, years now, and I haven't found, like, I, I had one person I referred to, to take insurance, and now I have none. So, um, so it's mostly private pay, and that's really unfortunate. So helping people find the resources to get the help that they need um, is also tough. And like Yosef mentioned before, um, I think rapport is a huge thing. So 
what I try to do is convince people that if they need to go with someone in their insurance network, they need to make four appointments and go to all of them and see who they like. Because if they like someone, it's going to go really far. But convincing people to do that, you finally decided that you're willing to take help. You, you're willing to take help, and now you need to, to book four appointments for four different people and go to all of them. Like, yeah, um, they're it's not the best suggestion. So. Um, being supportive. I hate when, like, you know, I, I don't know, as a person, don't you hate when your friends try to play psychologist on you? I hate it, and I'm, I am a psychologist. It's just like, don't don't tell me I'm anxious now, leave me alone. Um, you know, like, sometimes my, my patients will throw it back, and they'll say, like, oh, I hate doing that. They'll be like, oh, but when you say blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, no, this is not the way this relationship works. What I try to do <laughs> So really what I try to do is be supportive, but also help people not avoid. So not so be supportive without enabling. So if someone's saying like, you know, I'm anxious and I'm just not gonna do this thing. It's like, no, you're anxious, but you still need to do this thing. Like I'll do whatever it takes to help you, but I work a lot with kids, so I'll do a lot of um, work with their parents. And even if a kid's not ready for therapy, often that's what I'll have the parents do. And I figure, and I'd imagine friends can, can have similar roles. Like, you don't have to let your friends get out of something because they're feeling anxious, and you can also be supportive at the same time. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not an excuse. It's not like, well, I understand you didn't come to my wedding because you're feeling anxious. Like, it's still not okay, but y you can understand it. Um, so it's I sort of a tightrope, but um, you know that would be, I guess, my suggestion. Um. Do anxiety disorders disappear? Um, so the way I tell people is when people start treatment. I'll say CBT is a pretty short-term treatment. It's about teaching people skills so that they can be their own therapist. Um, once you have those skills, it's a lot easier to manage, and there are going to be times that are better and worse. And also, we know with age, um, any mental disorder tends to get better around, like you know, middle age, which is a long time, I know. Um, so they don't completely disappear, but they do tend to get better. Um, and you know, with treatment, they become a lot easier to manage. Like, if I see someone with OCD, I tell people, like, my final session is always like, hey, these are the things you need to watch out for in the future. And if you can't manage them alone with the tools that you have, you need to call me. Because it's never going to be as bad as it is now, or as it was, because now you know how to deal with it. So it's sort of like, more like asthma or some kind of chronic condition. You manage it and you're fine. You don't manage it, you like let it get out of control and it's gonna be a really big problem. But that also depends because something like panic attacks, I rarely see people who I treat for panic come back once they're treated because once they learn that a panic attack is really a false alarm in their nervous system and if they stay in the situation and not avoid it, then the panic's gonna go away and to not be afraid of the panic, then it's rare that they're gonna come back in and say, I'm having panic attacks again, because I'm gonna be like, so what? So you're having a panic attack. Is it gonna kill you? Are you gonna die? What, what's gonna happen? Um, so most people t who are successfully treated in that regard don't come back. Um, um, a lot of the things like I've learned to, to cope with uh, anxiety are from like CBT. Uh, I guess technically, if I stop if I stopped implementing these these techniques, I would I guess come back into a go back into a much more anxious state. But but um, they've been, because I've been using them for so long, they've become so ingrained in my like, my psyche that I would never stop to like doing these. For instance, like tonight I spoke, I have a terrible fear of public speaking, but I know that um, I have to do this because or if I don't public speak, I'm terrified of it. So that's one of the ways I live my, my life. I, I always do things that I, I hate doing. Um, for instance, like I mean, for heights, I went skydiving to combat that. Um, so, so I and that's like so ingrained. I always do things that I hate, not because I like them. Because so I think it's very hard to if you do CT properly, I think it'd be very hard to lose what you what you've gained. 
um, if you did it properly. Um, that's funny because I actually have patients tell me that they've done things that they hated that weren't anxiety related because they had it so ingrained to do things that they hated that they're like, I went and I ordered a salad and I hate salad, but then I realized it wasn't because of anxiety, I just ordered a salad that was not <laughs> <laughs> <You know. laughs> Yeah. Be as honest as possible. You're not hiding anything. You have to do yourself any favors by hiding anything. Um, I don't really speak from experience, but I can only imagine that um, that by being open, you're, being, you're doing yourself the biggest favor and doing your, your partner the biggest favor. Because um, it's going to come out eventually. If you, you know, so why not have a discussion right away as opposed to having a fifth and sixth date? And yeah. I think also being open is really the way to go. In, in my practice, actually, we'll talk all the time. People will come in and be like, how do I tell people I'm anxious? We're like, so what? You're anxious. Big deal. Everybody's anxious. We'll say things like that. Like, you know, everybody has their thing. So anxiety is yours, and you need to own it, and it's okay. Like, yeah. And if someone doesn't accept you for that, then they're a jerk. They shouldn't be that. <laughs> Well, just my difference is it's much easier to bribe kids than to force them to do things that they don't want to do. So, like, I'll make a sticker chart, and if you get five stickers, you get ice cream. So, that's really it. But, like, we're still confronting the things that they're afraid of. It might be ridiculous. I also try to make it a lot more fun. Like, I had a kid who was afraid of um, toilet flushing, the noise. So, we played a game where we, we have two bathrooms in the office. Who could flush more toilets in two minutes? So we ran back and forth, and we flushed a lot of toilets, and you know, and it was fun. But he was also scared, and that's you know, you can't do that as much with adults. I much <laughs> prefer. <laughs> yeah, with adults it's more like let's do the thing you're anxious about, and now let's just wait. No, nope. still anxious? Okay, wait. <laughs> still anxious? Let's wait. <laughs> you know. So how's your life? There's a lot of like dead space, so I like kids better. Um, so, um, someone asked, why did antidepressants work for anxiety? Um, because antidepressant medication work, m medications are the medication for anxiety. Um, yeah, it's just antidepressants work for anxiety and depression, which points to maybe um, there's a, a big research group in Boston, um, led by Dave Barlow, that are working in, on this treatment protocol called the Unified Protocol, and it treats basically anxiety and depression the same way. And um, the idea that the medications work the same for both disorders might point to maybe this, this maybe depression and, or, and anxiety are flip sides of the same coin. Um, especially people because people who are depressed are pretty much always anxious. For anxiety, it's not always the case. People can can be anxiety uh, anxious but not depressed. Uh, so what I'm asking is a little related to what the girl. But um, like this, this talk is like considering a taboo talk. Like, what can we do as like the Jewish community overall to make it more accepting to talk about disorders, or for someone to admit that they go to therapists? Because you said the numbers are eighteen percent, but no one ever talks about it except like you said, your closest friend. So how can we as the Jewish community try to change that? Talk about it. Really is. Or hang out in the waiting room where I can't tell you how many people bump into people that they know and they're like, oh my god, I bumped into someone I know. I'm like, you're both in therapy. You're both in therapy. Same both. Stop freaking out. Um, <laughs> you know, so like. But it's like everyone's probably scared. They're the one person. They're not the one person. They're not. What? Yeah, so you tell your one friend that you're in therapy. Everybody sh should tell two friends, no, but not really. You have to do what you're comfortable with, you know? But the truth is, when I speak at communities that are not from, and everybody's talking about, like, well, my therapist said this, and by the way, my therapist said this. Like, no one does that in the from community. And that might be a little over but, like, the truth is, it's also not so bad. 
Like, it's not so bad to be anxious, and it's not so bad to, you know, it, it's a lot of suffering, but in terms of the numbers, if you're going to, um, you know, I, I actually have a friend who was dealing a long time with, with weird health issues and finally went to a doctor, finally got di diagnosed with depression, and, you're, and, and he went and he told his roommates, like, hey, guess what? I'm depressed. They finally figured it out. And his friends were like, don't talk about it. Don't tell anyone. You'll never get married. Um, got married. He's fine. Sadly. But, like, he, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Um, we need to, like, it's a slow process, but you need to just start talking about it. Yeah, I really second that. I just, like, I, I, when I tell my friends, I, I, I tell them, oh, it's good for me to get to speak about it. But I, I, um, I hope that, that one of them, like, maybe they have it, some disorder and they can, they will go seek help. I remember the first time uh, that I met someone with, an, with a mental illness that, after I was diagnosed, I thought it was, like, one of the most surreal moments of my life. I'm not alone. Uh, and of course now I know like, I know so many people with it. Um, the numbers like one in four, one in five people with mental illness with anxiety disorder like twenty percent. Um, so if it, it becomes part of the culture where it, it's it's just something that we have, like people have diabetes, people have anxiety disorders, you know, it's it, it, you know we live with it. So um, I, so I think we need to talk about it, talk about it, talk about it until we don't talk about it anymore when it becomes something that's so normal that we never talk about um, diabetes. Because it's, no one just, you know, no one's, I think most people shouldn't be, uh, you know, upset that they have diabetes or embarrassed of it. So I think we need to create that uh, environment for uh, mental illness and anxiety disorders. Yes. that insurance companies don't pay as well for mental health, so in order to make it worth it, it does, doesn't make sense. Do you think that's going to change? No. I wish I could tell you otherwise, it's just not going to change. Um, yeah, no, it's just a shame. So, But I can tell you there are community, like a lot of community options that people don't pursue. I didn't know this until working on the other side. Um, a lot of my patients will come in with very creative solutions. They'll go to the rabbi, they'll go to you know, a community center, and they'll get sort of um, other people to pay for their treatment if it's necessary. And I know it's a hard ask, not minimizing that, but you know, like um, I've seen a lot of people be very creative, and I've also found out that if uh, you call your insurance company enough, a lot of times they're more flexible if you're more annoying. Um, we've had patients call up and be like, well, this is specialized, CBT is a specialized thing, I just can't go to anyone on my panel and get it, so you need to cover more, and sometimes they will, so be annoying. Yeah, yeah and CBT is short, so theoretically it costs less, less money. Like, when I tell patients, I'm going to see them between 8 and 16 weeks on average, so every person is different, but that's not a huge amount of time. And I also tell people, this is instead of going on a vacation. Like, you know, obviously not everyone can even afford that, but if you can, and it's necessary, like, you, you spend the money and then that's it. Like, you, you'll have the tools to at least, you know, mostly get through a lot of what's bothering you. So I think it's a worthwhile investment, even though it is a really big sum of money, and I get that too. I really can't because I'm a kind of behavioral therapist, and from the former former students of mine in the room will tell you, I I don't necessarily have enough of our perspective to be able to do that effectively, so. <laughs> How does CBT work with um, the general anxiety disorder as opposed to like, a very specific fear or phobia? So again, it's about treating the skills. It's about helping people, one, um, not take your thoughts as facts, so figuring out how to think rationally about, you know, expectations of others um, and, um, you know, what sort of cognitive er errors that you make. Do you, um, one common one that I see all the time, are you, like black and white thinking. The people who think in black and whites are gonna be a lot more anxious. They're gonna make a lot more, you know, um, 
they're gonna think a lot more negatively than people who don't. So helping people who make that kind of error think more in the gray and saying, okay, if there was 100 people in the room, would they all think like you? And then also, people with generalized anxiety, helping them focus on whatever their fears are and exposing them to that. And it could even be exposing them to their work. A lot of people with anxiety are afraid of their worries. Like, I can't handle this, I need to avoid it. I'm avoiding my, my worries all day and it's hard. Instead of avoiding your worries, picking a time and worrying your heart out. Like, 5 to 5.30 is my worry time, and I worry about everything that was on my mind, and the rest of the day I'm not allowed. I have to keep a notebook, and I have to make a list of all the things I'm going to worry about from 5 to 5.30. So really individualizing it and figuring out what someone's afraid of and helping them face those fears. I had a lot of success with CBT for uh, socialized anxiety disorder, but social anxiety disorder, but uh, not so much with general anxiety disorder. So th there are other therapies. I, I have, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, existential therapy, which is like more philosophical. It's based off like the works of Roland May and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean there are other therapies for Frankel. Frankel yeah. So I mean there there are options. Um, for, for uh, generalizing anxiety disorder besides CBT. But I think CBT is, is I mean, it, 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 it's the quickest, so it, it, it's, it's the most intense, but it's, if you want to like be done with it, which I, I, th I can figure most people want to do, want to be like, just do the, you know, do the max work, like 18 weeks, and, and as opposed to sitting in therapy for people for years with just talking about it, not as direct. So. I've only seen this as an educator, but I imagine it's true for parents too. If you have a kid who has anxiety, uh, sometimes he or she could, will often say, I can't do this right now because I'm feeling very anxious about it. And you have to be sympathetic with that because they might really be anxious about it. Um, at least that's what, I, that's what they tell me. I don't really know, I'm not an expert. And so how do I know, first of all, when they're really being anxious or really when they're using that excuse? not to do the work that they're supposed to do? And how should I end up when they are being anxious? Should I make them do it anyway? Or should I, what should I do? So that's funny because I literally got a text on the way here from a parent who was saying, oh, my daughter called because she was anxious and she wanted me to pick her up from school. And I said, no, and did I do the right thing? And blah, blah, blah. I'm like, absolutely, like, leave her there, you know. Avoiding is not the way to help, but I think as an educator, the thing to be careful about is it's not your job to make that decision. It's more talking to the parents and talking to the mental health professionals and deciding what the best thing is. Because my goal as a mental health professional is always to get the child to not avoid and not make excuses. And depending on the situation, if someone's deathly afraid of failing, then it then, you know, and they will not be able to function if they do, then sometimes I'll make accommodations for that, especially in kids in the beginning, but the goal is to have them do all their work and not avoid it. So what I'll do sometimes is, I actually had a girl today who um, cries and freaks out and won't do her homework, so she'll run out of the room. I'm like, it's fine that she's running out of the room, but make her, make her take her homework with her, because she does not get to run away from the work. She can, it might be too much for her to do in the classroom right now, but we can't accommodate, you know. We need to find a way to get her to the point where everybody is. Um, okay, thank you so much, Dr. Galante and Yosef. Um, Um, I really want to thank everyone uh, for coming. Um, the more people that hear and listen and understand, I think the better off our community is. Um, just in case you didn't see on the way in, we printed up sheets with resources uh, for anyone that's interested in seeking further help or has a friend that they think that they could help. And also our shul happens to have a partnership um, with a social worker from the Y. Um, so if anyone is feeling like they need to speak to someone or they need some treatment, you're welcome to come speak to me or Yanmeet, can you just raise your hand? Um, and we can direct you towards her. Um, just to let you know about some upcoming programs within the next three days, uh, we have Hospitality Shabbaton happening on Shabbos. If you have not yet signed up, please do. It's a great way to meet new people. You could tell them all about this event and what you've learned. 
Um, and then on Sunday, for those of you that it's relevant for, we're having a program on religion, intimacy, and sexuality. Um, it's going to be a whole morning event. Um, info is on the website, or you could uh, find me and ask me questions. So again, thank you so much for coming. Are you guys around for the next few minutes if people want to come speak with you? So if anyone has any further questions, uh, feel free to come speak to them. And again,